All right. I hope you're ready because Henrik and Milos are going to tell you something about hacking RFIDs or attacking RFID chips. And um, they're both known for um, their community work for many years. For example, Sputnik and other RFID projects from uh, 233 and other camps and events. All right. Give the guys um, a warm welcome. Thank you. Hi, um, we're going to talk about RFID and because we know that there are often some misconceptions about what these cards uh, there are often some misconceptions about what these cards are and what they are not and what they can do and what they can, can't do I'll start with an introduction into ISO 144443 which is the uh, ISO standard for the most common type of RFID cards, or the uh, most interesting type of RFID cards. Um, it's an international standard for proximity integrated circuit cards, which basically means um, that, um, of course, it's an integrated circuit card. That's like smart cards you might know with contacts, but these are contactless, and proximity means that the range, the specified range, is about 10 centimeters. There are other types of cards, um, like vicinity, which is, I think, one meter, and a close coupling, which is one centimeter. But 14443 is about the proximity cards. Like some other standards for RFID cards, it works on 13.56 megahertz, which is a frequency which was uh, free because nobody wants to use it because, uh, for example, these... Uh, uh, welding machines work on the same frequency and you can't really do another thing with it. The ISO 14443 is divided into four parts. Part one specifies the physical characteristics which look just like the standard credit card size we all know and also define how big the antenna must be and approximately where it has to be positioned. Part two specifies the radio frequency and the signal interface. For example, um, this um, will tell us how the power is transmitted to the card because the card has no, no contacts but also doesn't have a battery. It's a passive card and uh, we somehow must get power into that card. This is specified in part two. Um, I'll show later on a very simplified example of um, how that looks in, in a circuit diagram. Part three is uh, the initialization and anti-collision procedure. I'll uh, quickly cover that later too. And part four is one possible transmission protocol that you can run on these other layers. Uh, yeah, that's a layered approach. You can have, uh, you can implement one, two, and three, but don't have to implement four. But if you want to implement four, you have to implement one, two, and three also. In ISO 14443, there are actually two types of cards specified. Um, that's type A and type B. Type A is basically the proprietary MyFair card standard from Philips, and they just put that into the standard and type B is a different type. Um, type A is most common because it's MyFair and there are millions and millions of these cards. Type B is less common. The, both of these um, types differ in the modulation and uh, encoding that they use. Um, type B has a more complicated um, modulation scheme which also transmits more power to the card, which means that um, if you have a card that le needs a lot of power because it's doing a lot of cryptography, you are most likely likely take t part, uh, type B. Um, that's, because, that's why it's used in some of the electronic passports, but not all. I think about 30% of passports are type B. And most other cards that you'll encounter in daily life are type A. I've actually only seen about two type B cards in my life, 
and and a lot of type A cards. Um, now about the modulation scheme that's used from the um, actually the device. The reader device is called a proximity coupling device, PCD, and the card, as I already mentioned, is called a proximity integrated circuit card. And the modulation scheme from PCD to PICC, from the reader to the card, in type A, uses uh, the simple amplitude shift keying, which is basically amplitude modulation. You switch the carrier on or you switch the carrier off. Um, but as I already said, the card needs the carrier to gener generate its power, to get its power from, so you can only switch off the carrier for very, very short amounts of time. Um, however, this modulation scheme is easy to receive because either the carrier is there or it's not there. You don't have to worry about um, the carrier changing uh, its amplitude, as in type B. Type B is 10% amplitude modulated, so you must distinguish whether the carrier is currently at 100% or at 110%, which is harder to do. For type A, you just have to see whether the carrier is there or is not there, which can be done easily over a long range, depending on how good your receiver is, maybe 10 meters or more. And as you see, Should the mouse be Nein. Wo willst du denn hin? As you can see, if you um, do the amplitude demodulation, this is basically the carrier strength. This is um, what data from the reader device to the car device uh, looks like when you just look at the carrier strength. See carrier there, carrier not there, carrier there, carrier not there. And that's where the data is encoded. Um, the um, reverse direction from the card to the reader device is uh, different. Um, that's because the card doesn't have a lot of power and um, it doesn't have a contact. So it uses load modulation, which basically means you can imagine that if you use um, for your model railroad at home a transformer to go from 200 volts to 12 volts, you will have um, two uh, coils next to each other and you um, induce a magnetic field, an alternating magnetic field in one of the coils, which will then induce a, a voltage in the other coil. And that's basically just how these cards operate. The card, uh, the card antenna is just a coil in, inside the card and the reader device has just a coil as an antenna and you um, transfer power by induction. And the uh, reverse direction to get data from the card to the reader device works by load modulation, which means that the card has a, a load, a resistor, which thus uses power and can switch that resistor on or off. There's a switch. Well, actually, it's a transistor, most likely. And if you switch the transistor on or off, it will take more or less uh, power and um, reversely that will be, you can detect that at the reader device. Just as you can at home uh, when you use that uh, model railroad at home, when the train is moving it's using power, that power must come from there somewhere. When it's not moving it's not using power and um, it's not getting power from the power grid. So you can measure whether the, the resistor is, is using power by just measuring the uh, current. Um, however, that signal is very weak. It's only basically only an artifact of, uh, of the power transmission. That means it's, it's way below the carrier signal, about 60 or 80 decibels below the carrier signal. It's hard to receive, even over the short range that is specified, 10 centimeters is possible. Is, uh, it gets harder from there. Maybe you can, if you have a good antenna, do 50 centimeters. If you have very, very, very good equipment, you might be able to do one meter. But after that, it's pretty much impossible to receive the signal. So that was a quick introduction about on how the uh, carrier, uh, how the power transmission and the data transmission works. Now um, to the um, context uh, subject of anti-collision. 
as I said, uh, part three specifies the anti-collision procedure because if you have more than one card and put them in the field, the field will power more than one card and you somehow have to select which card you want to use. You, uh, if you send something, you must know, you must specify to which card this is directed and you'll have to know before that uh, which cards are there. That's why ISO 14403 defines an anti-collision procedure and the important thing about this anti-collision procedure is that every card needs a unique identifier. It doesn't have to be a fixed unique identifier, it just needs to be reasonably unique. Either it's a fixed identifier that's programmed at the factory or the card uh, generates, uh, generates a random identifier on each time you put it into a field. That's what, what most passports do. Um, I don't want to go too deep into this anti-collision procedure, just remember that every card needs an unique identifier and it's transmitted in the clear. Now I want to say something about the different uh, card types that you might encounter in daily life. As I said, most common are the MIFA types, that's why I'm talking about these the most. Actually, most common may not, most common alpha ID may not be MIFA, but uh, much dumber tags like electronic product code or even these uh, things, these very chips that you implement, implant to uh, your pets. But I don't find these particularly interesting. They usually don't have any security features and are just dump storage for a couple of bits, while um, these MIFA cards are nearly smart cards. They can store one to four kilobytes, maybe more, and have some, some intelligence to them. Or maybe even the passports are even more intelligent, are also 44 of the cards. Um, the first um, MIFA card type that I want to talk about is the MIFA Ultralight card, which is the simplest and most inexpensive MIFA card type that's uh, designed to be used in tickets, in one-time tickets, one-time use tickets and disposable tickets, like for example for uh, soccer games. Um, the um, World Championships in 2006 used these uh, type of chips in the tickets, in their tickets. The ultralight card uh, has uh, 46 bytes of storage, of which 10 bytes are read-only and programmed at the factory. Seven bytes of those are the unique identifier that's programmed at the factory. There are six bytes of uh, programmable read-only memory that you can set from zero to one, but you can never s uh, set these bits back from one to zero. Um, two of these bytes are used for lock bits that you can um, if you set a lock bit, then that means that some of the pages, the pages that the lock bit refers to, will not be writable after that. That's what lock bits are for. And then there are 48 bits uh, remaining of usable memory that you can either write as often as you would like, or if you enable the lock bits, then you can't write it anymore. The ultralight card is inexpensive because it doesn't have any encryption whatsoever. It has no security features, except maybe if you want to count the unique identifier as a security feature, then that might be a security feature. But as I said, it's transmitted in the clear and um, easily you can easily fake it if you have the right equipment. Um, that's the MIFA ultralight memory layout. As you can see up here, the UID is stored. There are some, the CC, there are two check bytes about over the UID to see whether it's transmitted correctly. There's one byte for internal use only. They don't say what it means. These are the lock bits. They are only uh, programmable ones. And there's an OTP area, one-time programmable memory, that you, for example, can use for uh, single-trip or multi-trip tickets. And you can, if you have a transportation system, and you sell a card for 10 trips, you can use each of these bits for one trip and set it when the trip is being used, when the customer enters the train or whatever, and afterwards the bit can never be reset. So it's, uh, if you don't ha have the equipment to emulate that card, that might be secure. And there's a user area where you can write other cards, other things. The next type is the MyFair Classic, which might be the most uh, uh, common card type. 